You're watching Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO TV. And now, here's two guys who couldn't even get an interview for the Raptors coaching job, Evan and Joe. I'm Joe Tykotsky down in New Haven, Connecticut. And I'm Evan McFarland here in what I believe is St. Andrews, New Brunswick. A little hazy, hard to tell where I am today. <laughs> You're watching. But that's the sky. That's the sky, not me. I'm not hazy. <laughs> You're watching episode 56 of Mick and T Sports Report. Um, we had decided uh, years ago, near the start of our show, not to really cover day-to-day -day sports on the show, sort of make it more of a sports variety show, but we would be remiss if we didn't congratulate the Denver Nuggets and Canada's own Jamal Murray of Kitchener, Ontario, on winning their first NBA championship. Yeah, that's that's huge. What a, like They were so good. They looked dominant right from the beginning of the playoffs, but uh, Jamal is just a showcase of kind of what's going on in Canada right now. We're, uh, we're developing some really high-class players, and I didn't really mind who won that series. I could have, I would have been pumped if Kyle Lowry got another ring, but uh, to see a ring come up across the border, I'm pretty excited about that. Big things ahead for Canada ball. It is impressive. Um, and then we have a little local story. The first ever Subway sandwich shop will be opening soon in St. Andrews. And it's been a bit, some strong opinions on both sides of the aisle as it's the first chain restaurant uh, to open on Water Street. Uh, there's the Tim Hortons buried out of town. But uh, as a lifelong resident of the town, give us your hot take on this, Evan. Well, we're going to keep it as a lukewarm take, maybe. But uh, yeah, I, I, I can see there's there's arguments for both. Um, but in the end, uh, the owners, uh, Matt Harvey from St. Stephen, fantastic guy. I've known him for a while. Does a lot of local work, a lot of charity work. It's nice to see a guy like that coming in. And I'm going to use the expression that uh, I've heard many times is that high water rises all boats. So we'll see what happens. Okay. Yeah. As long as there's not another sports show on CHCO. Well, no, that, that would be an issue. <laughs> that competition we cut, but we have two great interviews on this episode. And after the break, we'll find out what happens when a golfer heads from Toronto to Alabama and if it wasn't for those damn YouTube licensing rules, right now I'd be playing Sweet Home Alabama, but you can just hum along in your head. Uh, you're watching Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO TV in lovely St. Andrews. Welcome back to Mick and T Sports Report here on CHCO TV. Our first guest was born in Helsinki, Finland, then moved to Moscow for nine years, then moved to Toronto, but now goes to college in Alabama. That's right. Keep the passport handy. Katie Cranston just finished her first semester at Auburn University, and only three months after arriving on campus, was named the Southeastern Conference Freshman of the Week in Women's Golf. She also tied for the second lowest round in program history with a seven under par 65. She played in the 2022 LPGA CP Canadian Women's Open and won the 2022 Porter Cup Women's Amateur. She's from Oakville, Ontario, just outside Toronto, where our recent guest, George Crown, is also from. He of Harvard squash fame. So let's get to meet Auburn University women's golf standout, Katie Cranston. Katie, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Thank you. All right, let's get rolling here. When did you first start playing golf and uh, growing up, what other sports did you play? So I first started playing golf probably when I was 10 or 11. Um, and I grew up playing like every sport you can think of. Um, I also grew up with two older brothers, so they were always playing sports. So I always just wanted to be in on that. Um, but I, from when I could walk, I started um, playing tennis and soccer and I started skiing at a really young age too. Um, and then I played those for a really long time. And then once I was older, I also played a lot of um, field hockey and ice hockey. Um, but yeah, just any sport in high school or middle school that they offered up, I was all I was always um, happy to do it. So, Good. Evan, awesome. 
yeah, 11 to start golfing and then to have the career so far that you've had is impressive. I know people yeah. that are much older than you that started when they were three and they're, they're awful. So uh, yeah. <laughs> good on you. But in order to get uh, so good at something like that, eventually playing all those sports, you do have to kind of cut down and specialize. So when did you make that decision to maybe focus more on golf than other sports? Yeah, so I think it was like 2020. Um, at that point, I was only playing golf and then I was playing um, field hockey at a pretty high level as well Um, and I just I don't know I I just definitely thought that I was way more engaged in the golf and I enjoyed it more and there was definitely more that I could do with it in the future um, and even just like for college and stuff so yeah I think it was just before COVID um, I kind of won like my first big golf tournament and I saw I just thought okay like I can do this and so from there I just um, you know, started going down to Florida a little bit more, doing some training camps and stuff and just putting myself out there. Cool. Um, what do you think the biggest adjustment has been going just from playing amateur and for fun to college golf? Yeah. Um, I think, um, like in terms of the field wise and stuff, there's a lot of the same people that I see in just amateur golf and that I've grown up golfing with that I also see in college golf but the biggest difference is definitely the team aspect of it um I've never played golf on a team and so it's definitely very different um and you're just constantly kind of thinking out there like if I'm having a bad day um someone might be having an even worse day so just kind of like you always have to keep on pushing um and you're thinking about your team and same with like kind of taking risks out on the golf course um sometimes my coaches kind of are like just remind me that I'm playing for my team and things like that um just kind of be a little bit more conservative sometimes and so that's a really cool perspective that I don't think Mm -hmm. a lot of people would understand about college golf that it is not as much about individual as your team so that that's really cool to hear yeah now Katie what would you say is the strongest part of your game and then on the flip side which part do you think you need to improve on a bit um my the best part of my game has definitely always been my distance and my ball striking um those are usually um just what worked for me the best but in the past couple years I've worked a lot on my putting and my wedges those are definitely the things that I'm always trying to improve on um my putting has definitely made really good strides in the right direction the last couple years um but wedges and putting definitely um still there's lots to improve on that's where you make the money. Yeah, exactly. Kevin, you have one more? Yeah, let's let's get off of the golf topic for a second. But uh, maybe how about something about Katie Cranston that most people wouldn't know? Yeah, so fun facts about me. Um, I'm a dual citizen to the UK and Canada. Uh, my dad's from the UK. Um, and then also I speak fluent Russian as a result of growing up in um, Russia and my mom uh, refused to send us to the English school. And so my brothers and I were sent to the all Russian um, school there. So we, yeah, fluent in Russian. Cool. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, now, in regards to the college life, I know you started mid-semester, but have you been to an Auburn football game yet? Yeah. So unfortunately, when I, because I started in the spring, there were no football games in the spring, but I went on a um, an official visit in November of last year and I got to go to my first game and it was crazy like it was my first football game I've ever been to um, I've only ever been to like hockey games in Toronto um, some soccer games but it was crazy just like the amount of effort and things that go into it and how many fans were watching and just the atmosphere um, it's crazy I'm really excited for football season this year did the, do they fly the eagle in at the start of the game? Yeah, they did. They did. The eagle like does a lap and then um, lands in the middle. It was so cool. So cool. Now, who do you remember who they played the game you went to? Yeah, so it was against um, Mississippi State. And we had like, it was like a ridiculous lead. Like everyone kind of like, I feel like people probably started leaving because they were like, oh, we're going to win. And then it just turned around so quickly and we lost. And I just remember like how devastated some of the fans were like, they're so, so into it that they were just like heartbroken. 
Well, I'll, I'll give you a quick story. I actually went to two Auburn games way, way back. Hey. And one was with um, a friend of mine, Doug Watkins, who actually does the graphics for our show. Game ends and we're packing up the tailgate. And I said to my friend from Auburn, I'm heading back to the hotel. And he said, oh, we're not going anywhere. And I said, it's like six o'clock. It's over. And he said, oh, we're still going to eat some chili, have some beers and listen to the Alabama football game on the radio to root oh against my them. Gosh. <laughs> So uh, I'm sure yeah. the two word the two words you will learn to uh, remember to hate is roll tide. Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like if I'm, I'll be walking through the airport in like Atlanta, and someone, and I'll have like an Auburn shirt on, and so people will be like roll tide or something. It's it's crazy down there. Yeah. Now one last question, and I've always wanted to ask a really good golfer this question. If I played you in miniature golf, would you kick my butt or would I have a shot at all? Does it translate at all? Honestly, I think you'd have a shot um, because I play like my mom golfs a little bit. She's not very good. She's she's decent. Um, but if we <laughs> Sorry, do like, <laughs> yeah, if we, <laughs> if we do like a mini putt, I mean, it's pretty it's honestly just kind of like luck of the draw. So she could definitely it could be it could be close. It could definitely be close. So if I it makes you feel any better, he said he's never asked a good golfer this, and him and yeah. I talk on a regular basis. Yeah, Evan, so that's kind I'll, of a kick to me. <laughs> besides Evan, Evan's a, Evan's a good golfer. Yeah, no, I think honestly, you'd you'd have a chance. Okay, all right. Yeah. So there's, there's a little hope. I'll uh, yeah. I'll keep aiming for that clown's nose yeah. on the eighteenth hole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, she is Oakville, Ontario's Katie Cranston, golfer at Auburn University in Alabama. Katie, good luck over the summer and during your sophomore season. And thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me again. Our uh, pleasure. Thank you. Well, coming up next on Small Town Spotlight, we head to Spring Hill, Nova Scotia to visit a museum dedicated to one of Canada's most famous singers, and no, it's not Evan, although I hear he sings a great medley of tragically hip songs. How's that for such a TV honest stuff? You are watching Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO TV. Welcome back to Mick and T Sports Report. For this edition of Small Town Spotlight, we head to nearby Nova Scotia and the town of Spring Hill. Originally founded as Spring Hill Mines back in 1889, the town has a population of 2647 and is located less than 30 miles from the border with New Brunswick. James Murray was Spring Hill's town doctor for many years and his wife was a nurse in the area. But the town's most famous daughter was theirs, legendary singer Anne Murray. Anne Murray has sold over 55 million albums during her 40-year career, and in 1970, she became the first Canadian female solo singer to have a number one U.S. hit with her song Snowbird when it topped the charts, and she paved the way for other female Canadian singers such as K.D. Lang, Shania Twain, and Celine Dion. She lived in Ontario for over 40 years, but in 2019, returned to live in her home province of Nova Scotia. In 1989, the Anne Murray Center opened right in her hometown of Spring Hill and houses an impressive collection of memorabilia from her personal life and professional career. To tell us more, let's welcome in Charlie Reindris, Outreach Coordinator at the Center. Charlie, thanks so much for being on the show. Oh, it's great to be here. Nice to see you, Joe. We've done some emails, but nice to see you. Great. All right, let's get right to it. Uh, what was the reason behind starting the Ann Murray Center back in 1989? Well, there were a group of volunteers in Spring Hill, Spring Hill, Nova Scotia, where Ann's from, um, and they were called the Spring Hill Industrial Commission. And they wanted to do something to recognize Ann's career and promote East Coast music, but also help the local economy, because, you know, there weren't a lot of reasons to visit Spring Hill at the time. So they approached Ann, and they came up with this idea that they'd create a center that celebrated her career. Um, it's funny, because at the time, in 1989, Ann was born in 45, so she was still only like 44 years old. She really resisted it being called 
a museum at the time. She, she got quite upset if you called it a museum. She was like, I'm still in the you know prime of my career. I'm only in my 40s. Uh, now that she's retired and she's now, how old would Ann be now? I guess she'll be 78 this year. She's a little more open to it being called a museum. Great. Now, um, about how many visitors do you get each year and how far have people traveled to get to the center? Yeah, each year about 6,000 people come. In the early days, it was even more, but then, you know, once people have seen it, they don't often come back. Some do. Um, so over time, it's been about 500,000 people have visited the center, but about 6,000 a year. And every year, Anne does a VIP luncheon, which is the big fundraiser for the center, and people pay a couple hundred dollars to come and have lunch with Anne. And um, people come from as far away as Australia and Thailand, so basically the other side of the world. They yeah. literally travel that far to see to see Anne Murray, uh, and then people come from across Canada and the states just to visit the center. That's great. Now, if we enter the center and visit, what would we see there? Well, actually, when you walk in, the very first thing you see is Anne's family tree. Um, it has all of her siblings and her parents, and you can push a button and it'll say, this is her brother, you know, Harold, and he was married to so-and-so and whatever. And you see, you can do her entire family tree. But then you enter the actual exhibit. And in the exhibit, you would see a lot of Anne's gold records. There are a lot of TV screens with video clips from different highlights of her career, whether it was, you know, performing with Kenny Rogers or on The Muppet Show or Night of a Hundred Stars. Um, Anne was quite a big celebrity in the United States as well. So a lot of those are American clips like Saturday Night Live and stuff. Um, but as I say, they're gold and platinum records. A lot of her awards are there. It's probably the only place in the world where you can see Grammy Awards, um, Country Music Association Awards from the United States and 20 Junos because Anne has, the Juno is the, Amer the Canadian equivalent of the Gra Grammy. And Anne has won more of those than any anyone. So there's a lot of those. Her, her mom was also a bit of a pack rat and kept everything. So that's in the museum. So you can like Anne's report cards are there. There's a clip of her, you know, her baby hair is there. You know, the, the dress she wore when she was christened. I'm pretty sure that's what that is. There's this little white dress. So there's tons of stuff about Anne. But Spring Hill is also famous for, um, it was a mining town and had a couple of mining disasters in the 1950s. Actually, Peter, Paul and Mary sang a song about it, the Spring Hill Mine Disaster Song. Some people might know that. Um, so there is a section of the museum that's a tribute to the men who lost their lives in the mines because that was happening as Anne was growing up in Spring Hill. Okay, and there's a, a section of it where you can sing that's right. Yeah, sorry, I forgot that. So as you finish the exhibit, there's a there's this recording studio, and you can go in there and you can sing along with Anne, and you get a little CD made. It's still a CD because you know it's what it, the center was started in '89. They still they record a little CD for you, and you leave with a CD of you and Anne doing a duet together. And then when you come out of there, there's a gift shop, and there's you know her records and and local stuff too. You can buy Nova Scotia tartans and things like that. Okay, so Anne and Joe T can uh, duet on Songbird or something like that? You certainly can, yeah. You Needed Me is one of her biggest, Snowbird, those ones, yeah. The, the, there's like a handful of them, but you could definitely do one of them. Okay, now how often does she appear at the center? Well, officially, she's just there once a year. She shows up for the uh, the VIP luncheon. So that's that's the big event of the year. We call it Anne Murray Day, and it's, it's to mark the anniversary of the center. So this year, I think, is 34 years. Um, but she lives nearby. She has a cottage in Pugwash, Nova Scotia, which is half an hour or so from Spring Hill. So occasionally she'll be on her way to Amherst to get groceries and she'll just drop in. And like I, Juanita, who runs the center, has told me a story about these people coming through the center and they were crying because they were like, I can't believe her career. It's so incredible. They can't believe we all said it, saw all that. And then Anne turned to them and said, hi. And they were like, hi. And they didn't realize who she was at first. <laughs> and then they realized they were actually meeting Anne Murray. So people, fans sometimes get a surprise when she shows up in the gift shop. <laughs> Now, how often have you met her? Um, quite a few times, actually. I, I, I actually, I, I grew up in Amherst and I, I was born in 66. So when Anne was getting famous, I was about four, but she was from Spring Hill. So in Nova Scotia, it was a big deal if a, a, a local person ended up on say the Glen Campbell show, which is where Anne got her start. So I remember my parents saying, that's Anne Murray. She's from Spring Hill and she's on the Glen Campbell show. And so I always grew up with her as a presence in my life. And so I was there when they turned the sod for the museum and I saw her in concert um, and stuff like that. And I went, to, I was on the board of directors for a little while in the early the mid, I guess, 2005 to eight or something. And I got to go to one of her final concerts and meet her afterwards. But since 2017, I've worked a lot with the center as their outreach coordinator. So I end up emceeing different events and stuff. So I work with Anne on those things during COVID and we couldn't do the luncheons in person. So they were online. So I was the host. So, you know, I would ask the questions on behalf of people. One weekend, so many people signed up that it took us four hours 
on Saturday. It was supposed to be three hours long. We spent four hours doing it on Saturday and four more on Sunday. So Anne put in eight hours on video, just answering questions. I said to her, I've loved you all my life, Anne, but even I'm getting tired of you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a classic. Now give us a, a tidbit about Anne that many people would be surprised to know. Well, I mean, if you're a real fan of Anne's, you might know this. If you're not, uh, she's an avid golfer. Anne started out as a phys ed teacher. She was, that's what she studied at school. And she actually taught high school phys ed for a year before she became a singer. So she loves golfing. She continues to golf to this day. Her cottage is right across the street from the golf club in Pugwash. But she was rated the number one female celebrity golfer in the world at one time. And she's so proud of that, that, that there's actually, that magazine is in the museum and she got a hole in one once and the golf club and her shoes and the story about it are all there as well. So, um, so she loves golf. Um, a couple of things that I find interesting, not really hobbies of Anne's or anything, but um, a lot of people wouldn't know that Seinfeld opened for her in Vegas. Like he credits her with the uh, helping start his career, Jerry Seinfeld. Jerry, Jerry Seinfeld? Yeah, she'd seen him on The Tonight Show and she liked him so much that she got him to open for her in Vegas and they got along really well. And she said she'd be in her dressing room and she'd hear him so much that she could basically do his routine after a while. So, yeah, so her and Jerry Seinfeld are friends and she knew him when. Nice, nice. I have one tidbit of my own about Anne. 1972, grade six at Caldors in Hamden, yeah. Connecticut. I bought Danny's song on a 45. Oh, did you really? Well, there you go. Not a lot of boys in grade six were buying Danny's song by Anne Murray. Yeah, yeah, that sunk me right to the bottom of the social uh, calendar. <laughs> yeah, I, I absolutely love I know it's a remake of a Kenny Loggins song, I believe. That's right, it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah great tune. All right, lastly, if I was visiting Spring Hill, Nova Scotia, give me a local non-chain restaurant that I'd enjoy eating at. I like there's a little pub called Sociables and it's not too far from the Anne Murray Center and I, I if you like pub food it's great they also they MC a lot or not MC cater a lot of events for us so they're really good at catering too we do dinner theaters as a fundraiser and, and the luncheon they do that too so they have all kinds of uh, different sorts of food and a nice little atmosphere for a small town pub excellent well you can find out more about the center online at annemurraycenter.com that's Anne with an E at the end. And for our Americans, that's center spelled C-E-N-T-R-E. -E. Uh, and he is Charlie Reindress, Outreach Coordinator for the Anne Murray Center, located in beautiful Spring Hill, Nova Scotia. Uh, Charlie, thanks so much for being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Joe. It was great to chat with you. Big wheels keep on turning. Oh, we're back. Okay, I welcome everybody. I got caught up in my own little world there. But uh, Joe, another great interview there. Um, Give us a rundown on that record store t-shirt. Yeah, it was a uh, that gaudy orange t-shirt I was wearing. It was from a place called Lucky Records in Reykjavik, Iceland. Um, and I just saw it online. I actually was in Iceland right when I got out of college for like 24 hours. That'll be a story for another uh, for another episode. But uh, check out, it's a pretty cool record store. Check out their website at luckyrecords.is. And uh, do you know who Iceland's most famous singer was or is? I, I feel like I do, but I don't. Bjork. Bjork, yes. Bjork, the one that wears those. I, I will not sing that uh, Sweet Home Alabama is the extent of my singing today. <laughs> okay. No Bork or Sugar Cubes tunes there. But all right, let <laughs> us uh, move on uh, to the shout out. We'll go with just you this time. What do you have? Yeah, this one isn't much as a shout out, I guess, maybe just to the uh, entire UMB athletic community. Recently, we we lost a longtime athletic trader, Joe Glenn, who was part of the hockey team for the better part of two decades. He was there for 18 years. Uh, Joe, I remember him when I first started with the athletic department when I was working there. I never saw the guy upset. He was, always had a smile. He always had a joke to say. Extremely hard worker. and. Uh, Morning to his his family and friends that knew him, but uh, just know that he has a special place on that team, and uh, he also has more rings than Tom Brady. So, props props to a great career. There you go. Well said. Well said. Well, that is it for episode fifty six of Mick and T Sports Report. I am Joe in New Haven, Connecticut, and I'm Evan here in St Andrews, New Brunswick. Thanks to Patrick Watt and Florence Mitchell, as always, for producing and editing a show that. 
I think Ann Murray needs to write a song about one of these days. If she's still into a theme song, but uh, and to all my friends north of the border, coming up next week, Happy Canada Day! Woo woo! <laughs> this is Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO TV in St. Andrews.